We will have uh, questions at the end. Uh, now it is my pleasure to invite Marcos uh, de Lima again. You have listened to his excellent talk in the first session. So he would be speaking on imatinib resistant uh, chronic myeloid leukemia in this. Well, me again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So actually, this presentation is um, Elias Jabour. Um, he is, see I changed my name now, I'm Elias. And uh, um, so his slides, this is in the Anderson data mostly, so just keep that in mind. Uh, and that's me. So <laughs> let's talk, I, I think I have way too many slides, but I understand you're gonna have access to the slides, right? I think you have the slides somewhere. So keep in mind that I'll, I'll pass fast in some of these slides, but they have a very good summary of clinical trial results, so it's good for reference. Okay, so let's, uh, let's first start by talking what is the benchmark, right? So here's a early chronic phase. This is the IRIS trial that, as you recall, established imatinib as the, the standard, if you will. And this is eight years later. So let's think about this a little bit. So this is the complete cytogenetic remission rate of 83%. And you can see event-free survival of 81%. So now, here you have the annual rate of transformation, right? So you can see the numbers. And you have to remember that approximately 40% of these patients had less than ideal outcome eight years later. Right? This is important. And what is that? No complete cytogenetic remission or a loss of the complete cytogenetic remission. So that's our goal. So our goal is major cytogenetic response, defined as less than 35% Philadelphia positive metaphases. Right? That's your, that's your goal. Um, so the European Leukemia Net has proposed these definitions, which I'm not going to elaborate on. Most of you know it. These are, are what's going to define. And I think as a practice for us, it's good to think of landmarks in time. Three months, six, 12, 18, makes life easier for us to think. So these are landmarks, and these are the goals that you'd like to have, right? So now. This is also recommendation, most of it based on data, sometimes just expert opinion. So this is the NCCN guidelines. As you can see here, at three months, the idea is that if your transcripts are below 10%, right, you're gonna continue your treatment with imatinib, dazatinib, et cetera, and then monitor PCR. If there is no relapse, you're fine. If there is a relapse, you're gonna change TKIs and we're gonna think transplant, right? This is reasonable. What happens if you don't achieve this landmark? Then you start thinking of compliance. This is an interesting slide, look at this. I'm showing one slide here. So adherence is a very important thing, needless to say. If you don't take the drug, you're not taking the drug, right? Uh, um, and you can see here, look at this, the molecular response for those who take 90%, so it's not 50, 90% of the intended dose the difference is huge, so that, just keep that in mind before we label patients resistant to imatinib. What else? Event-free survival, response to imatinib at six and 12 months. This is another paper, this is by Alvarado. And you can see here now using six months, the difference is huge for those who do not respond at that mark. And here again, this is MD Anderson, this is patients who achieve a major cytogenetic remission at six months. And you can see the difference against those who did not achieve that landmark, okay? And this is, again, data from MD Anderson at 12 months for those who achieved the remission and those who did not. So again, I'm trying to think of landmarks, right? Um, what about 12-month response, complete cytogenetic remission with or without a major molecular remission now? So it's another level of response. And you see that for those who are in complete cytogenetic remission, it didn't matter much in this experience if they were in a major molecular remission. This is important, why? Because as long as you stay in a complete cytogenetic remission, 
fluctuations in the PCR may not matter. This is a common problem, right? We see a PCR changing. Ah, it's time to change it. Not necessarily, as long as you remain in complete cytogenetic remission. This is an important slide. Um, what about this one here? I'm going to skip this slide. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I want to talk about this one. So what you see here is, again, the BCR levels. Now I'm talking about molecular, and this is three months. Remember I talked initially 10%. So for those who are here at three months, do much better than those who are not. So you can predict very early on which direction your patient is going. That's the message. Um, here, you probably are familiar with this. This is a randomized study that essentially compared the IRC and imatinib and 800. So you're cranking up the dose of imatinib. And uh, um, again, the idea is that you can predict the responses early on. Let's see, what else am I going? Let me skip this one. You can look, we'll look back later. And let's talk a little bit about the strategy. So, so say you're failing imatinib. Who, is there anybody here that used 800 milligrams of imatinib? Raise your hand. 800, imatinib. Any taker? One, two, three. Okay, so, so you can increase the dose of imatinib. Right? Good luck getting good compliance with that, but yes, you can. And, and so that's one strategy. Uh, um, obviously, you can use second generation TKIs. And uh, you have to remember that if it is a hematologic relapse, the likelihood of you increasing the dose of imatinib and helping is not very good. If you're full blown hematologic relapse, doubling the dose of imatinib is probably not a good strategy, okay? Uh, um, this is uh, data regarding imatinib dose escalation, I'm gonna pass. You can look at this slide later. And here's a very busy slide, another summary slide, comparing some features of dazatinib, nilotinib, and now buzotinib. And, and I wanna just remind you of toxicities, right? Pleurifusion, and then with nilotinib, a lot of uh, uh, pancreas and liver, and buzotinib is diarrhea, which is a very common problem. Um, Let's talk a little bit about dazatinib after failure of imatinib. I'm not gonna recite all these numbers for you, but you can see here the complete remission rates in chronic phase, accelerated phase, myeloid, and lymphoid blast phases, okay? Uh, um, and now here, you can see dazatinib again. For those who fail imatinib, they are in chronic phase still. And you see that major cytogenetic remission will be achieved in any dose, actually. 150 BID, 140 QD, 70 BID. Very similar rates. Uh, what about nilotinib? Again, after imatinib failure. This is a summary as well. You can see here that the complete cytogenetic remission rates are shown in yellow. Very similar rates. Um, what about, again, nilotinib? This is uh, MD Anderson data. The complete cytogenetic remission rate of 46%, a medium dose of 800 milligrams, okay, of nilotinib. And here, you can see also this is uh, uh, survival, the upper curve, and progression-free survival for using nilotinib after uh, imatinib. What about buzotinib? Let's talk a little bit about buzotinib. There is less experience here. So you can see again, these are imatinib either failure or intolerant patients. And again, you're gonna see a complete cytogenetic remission rate in the 40% range. As I mentioned before, diarrhea is uh, the most common side effect. Um, now, what about buzotinib in third line? So they already failed two TKIs. And what you see here is uh, this is the major cytogenetic remission and the complete cytogenetic remission rate. So for imatinib and dazatinib resistant, imatinib and dazatinib intolerant, and imatinib and nilotinib resistant patients. And you can see the complete cytogenetic remission is about 20-ish percent, 25%. Now, what about a comparison of this? So you can see here it's a summary slide uh, the complete cytogenetic remission rates are shown here for these three drugs. So again, this is a summary slides. You folks can look at them later, okay? They are very useful to, 
to, to, to keep the numbers in mind. Now, what is the side effect uh, spectrum here? I think we talk a little bit about this, diarrhea, and you're familiar with the others. I want to remind you the QTC prolongations, right, that are seen with dazatinib and nilotinib, especially when you're combining this with other drugs, such as sometimes quinolone, sometimes antifungal agents that can induce arrhythmias. This is something to keep an eye on, right, for dazatinib and nilotinib. What else? This is hematologic toxicity. Let's skip that one. And uh, uh, this is another message that I want to uh, emphasize. So when do you pull the trigger? Do you wait until hematologic relapse? Danger, danger. You guys remember Danger Will Robinson? Yeah. Lost in Space? No, oh, well. Old black and white it's a TV series. Uh, um, so here, if you start the zatinib at the loss of hematologic remission, you can see that this is the response that you see. OK, oh, here, down here, I'm sorry. You see the response. But if you wait, if you act at the time of loss of the cytogenetic remission, the, the response rate is way better. So the message is waiting until hematologic control is lost. It's not a good strategy. OK? And you can see the difference here between early intervention and late intervention when you already lost the hematologic control of the disease with imatinib. Uh, that's the message again. Uh, what else? Um, I'm going to skip that one. You folks can look. What is? Uh, I'll skip this one. And I will skip this one. So let's talk a little bit. How do you choose? So there are some ideas that you can think of. Obviously, the first one is always financial. Do we have the drug or not, right? Um, for those in accelerated phase and blast phase, it's reasonable to favor dazatinib. This is a little biased. Chronic phase, you're going to have a variety of permutations. Say, if you have the T315I mutation, well, nothing works very well. Bone marrow transplant as fast as you can, I guess, if possible. Uh, nilotinib, if you can get an IC50 and it's this high, don't use it. Same with dazatinib. What about clinical characteristics? You can see the buzotinib may be better if you have hypertension, heart problems. With case of diabetes and pancreatitis, you probably want to avoid nilotinib. And remember the QTC problems I mentioned to you with the cardiac. What about ponatinib? Let me do fast here. Ponatinib, now you have, it's a new drug. This is the PACE trial reported by Cortez. And I want to show you that for these patients who had failed two TKIs, at least, you see still 46% of complete cytogenetic remission. Very promising, obviously. I'm going to skip this, but just to show you this slide, that for patients in chronic phase that had the T315I mutation, okay, here in the left corner, you see a very high response rate. This is important, right, because all the other TKIs did not do that. And this is ponatinib. For those who are in advanced phase of disease, you can see here the complete cytogenetic remission rates for those in blast crisis. So quite, quite impressive. What about omacetaxin? We heard of the use of this drug, homoherentoin, in AML. You see here for patients with CML in chronic, accelerated, and those that had received more than two tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And you can see here, complete cytogenetic remission, 10%. And actually, and here is complete hematologic remission in accelerated phase. So the drug has activity for these very refractory patients. Now, what about allogeneic transplant? As, as, as the previous speaker indicated to us, it is always a difficult uh, decision these days. Sometimes, obviously, for the younger patients, and depending on the financial support that these patients have, it may make sense to consider allogeneic transplant sooner than later. We all know that. It's just a reality. However, it's reasonable to say that if you have everything, if you are in accelerated blast phase, you're going to use a TKI to bridge to transplant. Transplanting somebody in second chronic phase is way better than if they are in blast crisis. 
So you can rescue 40% of patients in second chronic phase, and you cannot rescue not even 10% of those with active blast crisis. Um, if there are imatinib failure in chronic phase, right, you definitely want to consider transplant if there is clonal evolution or no major cytogenetic remission ever with uh, imatinib. If they are young, and obviously we want a good matches. And, and, and here I'll leave the uh, blank because the best experience, and actually mostly the only experience coming out is from uh, uh, Peking, from Beijing, using haploidentical transplants for CML, and uh, we may have that discussion later. But I have no experience myself, and so still the recommendations are if you have a good match, which may not apply if we learn to do more haploidentical transplants in this situation. Um, what about the very old, you know, patients above age 70? Unclear, probably you don't want to offer transplant. So at the end of the day, we have to remember the goal is complete cytogenetic remission. Um, for those who are in complete cytogenetic remission, fluctuations of the molecular levels may not mean relapse. This is important, as long as they continue to be in complete cytogenetic remission. This is a very important message. Uh, um, this is the message here, the last one. And for those who are, for a long time, in complete molecular remission, are they cured? So we know that most of these people, if you stop imatinib, they relapse. So likely they are not. But it's intriguing to ask the question. Uh, what else? I think I'm going to pass this. Just remind you that for the T315I, you have ponatinib and you have homoherentoin as options for that difficult to treat mutation. And that's me. I'm sorry I passed the time, but I had so much information here. And this is Elias Jabour's email at MD Anderson. And this is my email again, if you want to email me. Thank you very much. Sorry for the time.